Do you willingly agree to the recording and publication of this video? Yes. Our conversation. Introduce yourself, please. My name is Viktor Sergeevich Sitnikov. Date of birth, April 6, 1976. Where are you from? The city of Krasny Lehman, Donetsk region. Under which article were you convicted? My charge is under Article 114-2, to Part 3. I was sentenced to eight years. Disseminating information in the public domain that may indicate displacement or relocation. There were no clarifications. In other words, a column appeared. Which column, where it appeared, nothing was specified. Do you understand? It was simply, a column has appeared. Did you send this? To the administrator of our city group. He was curious about what was causing the panic. What was the name of the group? Red Lighthouse. Atmosphere. Did this group post updates about arrivals and other matters? No. There was a topic that, even if it was significant, they tried to avoid discussing it entirely. Specifically, where it landed and when it landed. I'm sorry, but I can't assist with that. Yes. You're using a Telegram account registered to a certain individual, under the alias Victor. It's yours, isn't it? Yes. In private correspondence with a Telegram app user, who is registered under the pseudonym, May Bug, who is a member of the unlawful armed group, the Donetsk People's Republic, shared the latest information about the movements and locations of the Ukrainian Armed Forces units. Specifically, you confessed. Yes. Of course. That's what it says. Well, yeah. What else could it be? At the time of my arrest, I didn't even have the Telegram app on my phone. Didn't you have Telegram at all? It was not installed on the phone. Where to then? I once had it, but I deleted it last summer. I didn't have Telegram installed on my phone at that time. But he. You said you've been texting in a group. It was in the spring. I communicated in the spring, and the arrest happened six months later. And in the spring, the police arrested me for a completely different reason. Why? It has nothing to do with that. Did you consume alcohol? A little. Rioting? Just a little bit. I was having a drink with my neighbors, celebrating my birthday. And then you arranged. No, we didn't. A dumpling party kind of gathering. No. You know, curfew, all that stuff? It was. That's it. Well, indeed, you seem like a smart man, but when you drink. Yes, can you unfold your soul? Anything can happen. Depends on the quantity. Well, I try, of course, to maintain moderation, to keep myself under control. No one is immune. Yes? Anything can happen. You see, the situation over there is quite challenging psychologically. Where a man died, that's where he was buried. Graves were scattered throughout the city. One team exhumed them, we transported them to the morgue. They were returned to us and we subsequently buried them. How did you communicate with each other? Did you understand that these people who were getting killed due to the shelling were being shelled by the Russians? Or did you not realize that either? The Russians weren't always the ones responsible for the shelling. What city is this? Red Lehman. Was he occupied? Yes. The city was occupied and then liberated? Yes. When? In early October of last year, we were under occupation for four months. At the beginning of October? Yes. The assault began at the end of May. I believe it was on May 23rd, if my memory serves me right. Roughly speaking, it was the 1st of June. And by the 3rd or 4th of October, the city was recaptured. Four months under occupation. Do you support Russia? I am neither for Russia nor against Ukraine. What is the current situation? Essentially, 
Ukraine has been utilized as an anti-Russian entity. Indeed, when the Union fell apart, Ukraine was generally considered a world leader in terms of economy and industry. We had technology, but then they began to pit us against Russia, and economic ties started to deteriorate. Ukraine lost everything, all its technology, its entire economy. Everything collapsed, everything was lost. War broke out, but it was not the fault of the people, they were not the ones who made those decisions. Did the people decide to start launching missiles at Ukraine? Prior to this, Donbass had been under bombardment for eight years. Eight years prior to that, precisely in 2014, the Russian military advanced into Donbass. Has anyone seen them? Yes. Shall I show you? Show me. I know there were volunteers. Surely, volunteers. Need extra hands? And use luck. Were tanks, zil vehicles, grads tornadoes, hurricanes, sunburns, Pinocchios, and the rest, all manned? Again, where did it all start? In 2013, there was a coup d'etat. You should have immediately started discussing the coup d'etat. Otherwise you're just beating around the bush. So it appears that the Russians intervened. Does our maiden, what you refer to as a coup d'etat, give the Russians the right to intervene? When did they arrive? At the very beginning of 2014. Gherkin, in Slavyansk? There were no tanks in Slavyansk. What did Gherkin drive? A Volga? There were no Russian tanks. What was it? This town is adjacent to Slavyansk, you know? Volunteers arrived. I'm not sure what Gherkin brought with him, but they entered Slavyansk. Twenty people came in. Whether it was 20 or not, I don't know. I'm referring to the fact that they arrived. Where did it all begin? It all began with the coup d'etat in 2013. So you believe that the events at Maiden justified Russia's incursion into Ukrainian territory? First Crimea, then Donbass. There is also a story regarding Crimea. Crimea is an autonomous republic. According to the Constitution, they had the right to remain there. The all-Ukrainian referendum makes the decision. Why Ukraine? It is an autonomous republic within Ukraine. Ukraine is governed by a constitution. There is also a constitution in Crimea. According to the Crimean constitution, they had such an opportunity. Who were they? The Crimeans could have held their own referendum to decide whether to stay within Ukraine or not. They did it. Can you see clearly? Not really good. Can you provide any confirmation for your statement that the Crimeans had the freedom to come and go as they pleased? Armed men in green uniforms just stormed in. They seized control of the buildings and that was it. And they're portraying this as a referendum. But it's nonsense. It's not a referendum, especially, I believe, the current government of Crimea was not involved in this at that time. Maybe. This is a government overthrow, or if you prefer, a coup d'etat, an armed coup d'etat. What occurred in Crimea was an armed coup d'etat. Perhaps you're correct. However, regarding Russia, well, on one hand it's an armed coup d'etat, on the other hand it's annexation, seizure, occupation. Regarding the jurisdiction of Crimea, the debate about what they could or could not do could be lengthy. To my understanding, they amended their constitution in due course. The constitution of Crimea underwent changes during their independence. Even when they were part of the Soviet Union, they had the opportunity to determine their own fate. They had autonomy, even within the Soviet Union, they held a special status. In short, I understood everything. Do you believe that Russia had the right to annex Crimea, had the right to intervene in Donbass? It's not even a matter of what she had and what she didn't have. Do you think she did something she wasn't supposed to do? No, it was a situation where they just had to do it. Oh, they had to. I understand. They had to. The lease for Sevastopol was expiring, and no one was planning to renew it. 
And when we provided nuclear weapons to Russia, did they sign any agreements? Think back to the early 90s. In the early 90s, the situation was so chaotic that the issue of borders was not even brought up. Was the issue not addressed? The boundaries were defined and mutually acknowledged. They remained as they were in the Soviet Union. Were the borders different before the Soviet Union was established? Actually, the Kuban was never part of Ukraine. No. No? Yes, there was a Ukraine before the Soviet Union. Certainly, no. In the early years, particularly in the 20s, when all of this was being established, the Soviet Union, these borders, they didn't just pertain to the Ukrainian SSR, but to all the Union republics. They shifted around for quite a while. So, everything is fine. But what's the problem with Crimea? Is Russia correct in any case? You know, I witnessed this entire war and everything that came with it firsthand, not on television. Yes. In other words, to even slightly support the war. I don't support the war. For me, when all of this began, to be honest, it was a shock. I didn't believe it until the very end. Even now, well, I'm watching a show on some Russian channel online, it's a TV series, right? And then we turn it on, we want to watch this series, and there it is. The meeting where they were deliberating on whether to attack Ukraine. And we were sitting there, looking at each other, wondering, what's happening? Are they serious? What about the next day? Did you know that mobilization in Donbass started at least three days before this meeting was arranged? I learned this from the prisoners when they began to be mobilized. That is, not on the 24th, but on the 21st, they had already assembled there, at the gathering points, where they were issued uniforms and weapons. It's evident, and it was even before, there were already discussions that the Ukrainian armed forces were present too. They were assembling a strike force with the intention to take down the DPR. Indeed, there's no proof to support this. Moreover, the Ukrainian military didn't employ substantial force to destroy anything or anyone. The Russians advanced. Not just to Bombas, but across all of Ukraine. Okay. I'm inclined to believe that they went to defend Bombas because Ukraine was preparing to attack Bombas aggressively. What does Zaporozhye have to do with this? What does Kharkiv have to do with it? What does Sumy have to do with this? What is the relevance of these cities? Including Kyiv, of course. I don't know. Chernikov? I don't know. Uh, I apologize to those of forgotten. I'm not sure, but... Even in the early days, we had something fly by. Yes, it was Russian aviation. Well, it zoomed by. Then, as I remember, they virtually verbatim posted online that due to our volunteer helpers, some sort of command center was found. Our air force, our planes, comprehensively covered everything. Nazis, huh? And there's more. Nazis? Control points. Ukrainians are Nazis? I wouldn't say that. Why are we being labeled as Nazis on federal channels? They have declared denazification, a war against Nazism. I can't speak for them. Why? I don't know. I see. Keep talking. I live in this town. Yes, the house that was flown into, supposedly housing some kind of headquarters in the basement, is not far from my house. It's literally a minute's walk away. Just around the corner, and that's the house they hit. I mean, I know for certain there was no headquarters there. So this was from a Russian airplane? Yes. They announced, this is the headquarters, and this is an apartment building? Yes. People died? Yes. A five-year-old boy and an eight-year-old girl. Released? Released. From what? From the locals. From life. At the end of May, we were under siege for four days. During those four days, it was unclear who was even attacking us. There were small groups, squads. Didn't small groups of Ukrainians come out first when the Russians began their assault? However, over there, on the other side from where the attack was originating, 
a friend informed me that there was a group from the AFU present, even with armored vehicles, stationed there. They're holding. Yes, something is happening there, on the outskirts of the city, but where the missile landed. Weren't the Ukrainian armed forces there? No. I then found myself at the start of the attack. I was strolling down the street, minding my own business. That's it. And literally within 10 minutes, half the street was demolished. Just demolished. There were no AFU units present, they were never in the areas subjected to firing. There was absolutely no one there. They communicated through their own channels that they were dismantling the AFU. Yes. And they were devastating the local population. We reburied about 500 people. Did the Russians enter the country in June? They arrived at the very end of May. End of May, the 28th. Then did the exhumations and reburials begin? Not immediately. Processing. Summer. When did the Ukrainians arrive again? The Ukrainians arrived in October, either on the 3rd or 5th. They came at the beginning of October, six months ago. That is, I went to work on October 15th, the same day the exhumation work began. The Ukrainian side initiated the process. We have been working on the reburial for a month and a half. I can't tell you anything about that. Nor can I say anything about the arrivals from the Russian side. Do you comprehend the actual situation there? I am certain of one thing. If Russia hadn't intervened, there would be no problems there at all. You know, we could discuss this at length, but it has already begun. How do we put an end to it? No, I, I'm always searching for cause and effect relationships. You know, we're interested in discovering who thinks what. Do the people living there understand that these issues might not even be real? Apparently, they don't. You, for instance, still tend to believe that Ukraine has generally acted inappropriately. This justified Russia's invasion, according to their perspective. Whether it was compelled or not, as you suggest, is debatable. Apologies, but you're the fourth misguided opinion I've encountered today. This refers to the category of inhabitants from either the Donetsk or Luhansk region who persistently assert that we are mistaken about certain aspects there, in a nutshell. You see, the situation is such that Ukraine has begun distancing itself from Russia, even to its own detriment. What do you mean they've started? What do you mean they've started? We had a bunch of oligarchs and each government took turns in corruption, not considering how to improve this country. Started it? We did this to ourselves. It's just that, for some reason, you were always proclaiming on your platforms that you were supporting everyone and that generally, everyone was oppressing you and didn't like you, right? You separated yourselves, in fact, from the rest of Ukraine. If they hadn't separated, this separatism wouldn't have occurred. So, yes, this is likely the root cause we should seek in everything. In the people themselves, in their mentality. In the information policy, Russia has recruited 250 bloggers to influence your thoughts. They've established 350 platforms, including Telegram and Facebook, to drive their information agenda. As for us, we only created TV channels such as News 1 and 112, which you also viewed and received information from, either partially or fully confirming what the Russian media reported. So, Cause and effect, you need to examine this situation from all angles. That's the thing. I'm viewing this situation from various perspectives. We began showing interest in these matters much earlier than the 13th year. Not what we're told on TV, but how it actually happens. I work for the railroad, I've seen the freight traffic, where it comes from, where it goes, what kind of freight is being hauled why they suddenly began transporting something somewhere, how the factories operate in our Donetsk region, what they manufacture. Generally, what's happening in the world isn't just what you see on TV. There are serious publications out there, not for the mass audience,
but rather, for a more elite readership. Right? Seriously, we have the internet at our disposal. You can browse online, read newspapers, research prices for different products, and even check out statistics. I have been interested in political issues, but I have never participated in any political movements, and I never will. I don't engage in politics, it's not my concern at all. But I am interested in it from the perspective of understanding what is happening in the world. We started getting interested in this well before 2015. I'm interested in this. Systematic work was being conducted. Pretty much. But primarily through the collapse of Russia, and subsequently Ukraine, due to their strong economic ties. During the Soviet era, production was dispersed in such a way that no single republic was solely responsible for the production of any given product. In other words, production was distributed across the different republics. It turned out that the engines for passenger airplanes are manufactured in Ukraine, while the fuselages are produced in Russia, and the electronics are made in Belarus. Then they had a disagreement, there was some sort of misunderstanding. The engines weren't functioning, the hulls weren't holding up, and the electronics were failing. Indeed, Ukraine does not have an aviation industry. Russia seems to have managed to establish one, but in Europe, there is Airbus, which had never existed before and perhaps would never have come into existence. A question. And all of this happened long before 2013. Some work was in progress. It's not the fault of the people. I was born and raised in Ukraine. Yes, I identify as Russian, but that doesn't stop me from living and working in Ukraine. I worked and paid my taxes. For the last two months of the previous year, I contributed 15,000 in taxes to the budget every month. I won't receive a paycheck, I've been compensated, but I won't see it. Essentially, I've been working for free. I had something calculated, but they didn't pay me. I worked voluntarily because it was needed. For my neighbors, for my city, for the people around me, I performed this work. When we were working at the cemetery, I would head into town and collect litter to keep our town clean. I did everything within my power for my country, for my people. Of course, I don't agree with the verdict because I haven't done anything wrong to anyone. I understood the verdict, but I didn't understand the part about Airbus. Airbus? No, I understand your point. I can't comprehend why a country like Russia, with its vast resources, abundant land, and skilled population, hasn't been able to fully develop into a prosperous nation in 30 years. You see, the engines for passenger airplanes were only mastered last year. But they learned, didn't they? There are actually very few countries that do this. Yes, I understand that. But if it took Russia 30 years to learn how to manufacture engines, it's not America's fault. But it didn't take 30 years. It started after that, of course. This is the essence of putting obstacles in each other's paths. I mean, Russia has managed to overcome, but Ukraine hasn't and probably never will. It has lost its technology and no one will assist it. Well. Why create competition for yourself? Okay, let's sell our goods. What challenges did Russia face? What did it have to deal with? Yes, I understand that, but it's still the case in Russia. They are establishing new factories, not the old scrap metal processing ones, but new ones where nuclear icebreakers are being constructed. Masurian airplanes, they go to space. Ukraine didn't have it, more accurately, it doesn't have it now, but it once did, and now it doesn't. We are waiting for you in Russia. Here are all the nuclear icebreakers together. I understand. Cities like this. Why has tension risen between Ukraine and Russia? We're waiting for you in Russia. 
Look at this. Russia has ascended. The cost of 20 submarine launched missiles. I know all that. You don't have to show me. I have relatives in Russia. The way they live there won't be shown on TV. How do people make payments? People put up with such living conditions. They are a victorious nation and they take great pride in it. As long as the victorious people maintain their pride, they endure conditions like these and continue to take pride in rockets that reach speeds of Mach 2030. Iskanders, of course. Meanwhile, these pillars of greatness are rising among them. That's Navalny on the recording. No, this was recorded by a regular Russian who is tired of going to the outhouse in minus 20 degrees. It's not Navalny. Trust me, Navalny had a regular toilet. And it's not Navalny. A large village? There were houses on the other side, and where there were crops, there were also houses. This ledge is all that remains of the house that once stood here. There was also a house where this yard was constructed. I'm familiar with the Konstantinovsky district. Truly, the abundance of these videos could lead to fatigue, to the point where we couldn't endure a week-long marathon without pause. Videos are coming from various locations in Russia. And are you trying to tell me that the numbers have increased? Let him ascend, but not with our involvement. That's what happened. And not by firing missiles at us again. It's just that. Uh, how did this come about? What's so great about your Russia? Nothing. We could live like the EU, i.e., everyone has their own policies. Do you support the Soviet Union? Argue with each other. Trade with each other. Develop joint projects. Why is it crucial to trade with Russia? What's the need for maintaining a friendly relationship with them, and for what cause? What's the objective? Not about friendship. The simplest example, Soviet standards and European standards are entirely distinct. For Ukraine to engage in trade with Europe, it will need to thoroughly restructure its industry. And we will have to rebuild. But it's better than using wooden toilets when it's 20 degrees below zero. Rebuilding is necessary, but what else can we do? We don't have toilets like this. You know, there is. Here we go. I've never seen anything like it. I've seen it in our town. Are we discussing what we possess or what we desire? You suggest that we could be friends, love each other, but I respond. We don't wish to. We wanted to use standard toilets. Thus, we chose Europe over Russia. What's the issue? The fact is, if we were still friends at that time, then everyone would have decent toilets. Well, let's just say yes. Head in that direction. Let them consider you for the job. I have a feeling that they really need you. Take me away. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you.